Dude, that's behind the firewall. Launch a grenade into the other subnet. All right. I got this. Go! Hey. Ah, oh, yeah. There's no more viruses. I think we did it. It did it. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on InRange TV. Today, obviously, we are out here taking a look at M1 grenade launchers, because they're really cool. And quite honestly, who else has? I mean, right. you see these things in movies, and you see guys using them in World War II footage, but I don't think, and I'm sure there's somebody, but I've never seen any footage or any YouTube content or any internet content, I should say, um, of people demonstrating this. There's a little bit of stuff out there on people actually firing things, but no one really explains what's going on and what's being used and how it works and why. You know, you don't even see this a lot in war movies. No, not very much, and they actually were used quite a bit. Yeah, so the U.S. went into World War II without any sort of grenade launcher, because the U.S. went into World War II without all sorts of important military stuff. That seems to be a common American trend, quite honestly. Yeah, and... Remember, you go to war with the military you have, not the military you want. You go to oh. war with what's left from the military you demobilized from the last war. But that's a recent comment in yeah. relative time. Oh, absolutely. Anyways. Um, so, as World War II kicked off, the U.S. Ordnance Department kind of got this, you know, oh shit, we, we need a grenade launcher, let's see if we can design one. And they came up with a good one for the, the 1903 Springfield um, and the 1917 Enfield, but they had problems with the M1 because the gas pressure of grenade firing caused problems. Uh, in fact, one of the guys experimenting with this kind of system was fairly seriously injured by one of his experiments, trying to get a grenade launcher that would work. The problem is you get so much gas, extra gas pressure because there's so much more delay and getting a grenade off the muzzle than a bullet, that it does nasty things to the uh, the op rod and the bolt and all the working bits of a semi-auto rifle. I mean, these concepts were already understood for a bolt-action rifle. Right. I mean, th that's a simple thing. You lock the action shut with a proper launching cartridge, not a live cartridge, right? for the most part, and you'd, <laughs> and you'd fire your grenade. And that was all you needed to do. As long right. as you knew the proper protocol, how to aim the thing, what cartridge to load in there to, to launch the grenade as a projectile, you were fine. But now that you're dealing with a semi-automatic action, you've got an op rod, you've got a gas system, you've got a lot of things at play here that weren't before. And remember, this is the first widely fielded semi-automatic right. military rifle. People say, yeah, they had Mondragons, but you know what? They didn't have grenade launchers on no. Mondragons. So, so they're really, not only is the U.S. breaking new ground by fielding a semi-automatic rifle as its standard rifle, in the war, period. they're now also breaking new ground on launching grenades off of a semi-automatic rifle. Right. What they came up with was actually this really cool system where they put a little spring-loaded valve in the gas plug of the M1 gas system. And this was in production about the same time as the launchers were, which is to say mid to late 1943. The idea here is you actually have a little uh, spigot or a little uh, rod coming off the grenade launcher. When you mount this thing on the muzzle of the rifle, it actually depresses a spring-loaded plunger in the gas, uh, the gas screw, which opens a valve. And so now, instead of all your gas pressure going down and operating the action, now it goes down and most of it just vents out the front of the gas port, the gas plug. Uh, a little bit of it goes into the gas system where the spring on the op rod is more than sufficient to absorb it. And the result is you have this nice damage-proof uh, grenade launching rifle. So that said, um, there is still recoil because while the gun is not cycling, oh, yes. there, you are launching a very heavy piece of mass off the front of that rifle. Right. Recoil is, you know, what goes out also comes back. And this is a heavy grenade and it's going fairly fast. Mm -hmm. And now this actually gets into one of our major points, which is there are a couple different types of cartridges. First off, the grenade is directly in line with the bore. You don't use live ammo when you shoot these things. Because if you do, a bullet hits the grenade, the grenade explodes, and it kills you. This happened. And probably a bunch of guys around you. Yeah, probably. That's a yeah. big BFF situation. Yeah, there's some training stuff that the Army had on... They, in fact, there's a picture out there of a, an M1, or the most of the remains of an M1, where someone actually did that, and it's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, so, ball projectile is out. What you're going to use is... Most people call them blanks, but blanks not actually a technical term. The technical term is use a rifle grenade cartridge, which is kind of, to most people, indistinguishable from a blank. It's got a crimped, uh, like a star crimp at the nose of the cartridge, no bullet, 
and just a bunch of gunpowder. The idea is it creates pressure and throws the grenade without a secondary projectile. Now, a blank is used for ceremonial purposes, mm -hmm. honor guards, that sort of thing, and its job is to make noise. And it's, there's a lot less powder in a blank than there is in a rifle grenade cartridge. We discovered this firsthand because we have some of each. Now, in general, if you get ammo that has like a little, it's a round crimp and it's got a little paper disc in it, usually it's red, that's a blank, that's a ceremonial round. Um, the star crimp is, the real ammo, the real grenade rifle cartridges are star crimp, but you'll also find blanks that are star crimped. So it's kind of, who knows exactly what you have. Um, and what we found is with a blank, you'll get about 50 yards. Yeah, it goes poof and the grenade yeah. goes about 50 yards. And it's really fun to shoot because you can shoot it from the shoulder. There's minimal appreciable recoil and it's just cool. Yeah, you can just go pick it up, put it back yeah. on, shoot it again. Ready? That was way better. Exactly. And mind you, of course, this is an obvious thing, but let's make this statement clear. <laughs> that is a dummy grenade. We do right. not have live grenades. Live grenades are a no-no. Right. This is just a drilled out fake dummy grenade, but you're still launching the thing and watching go dunk and go out there and it's pretty neat. Yeah. Now with a legit uh, rifle grenade cartridge, you're gonna throw this thing literally 200 yards. Or further. Possibly even further. It's based on the angle of attack. I have the rifle out when you fire yep. it. And you do have a sight for that. We'll get into that in a minute. And it's also based on how far or how deep you actually uh, put the rifle grenade on the launching spigot. So I can put it, let's get it all the way off here. I can put this thing on to any of six different positions. There's number six, which is the shortest range. And as I spin it down here, this is just held on by friction pressure, um, all the way down to the number one position, which and, is the longest range. And those lines on there are intentional. That was for the guy in the field to be able to, based on the angle he's keeping the gun at when he fires it, Yep. And what number he set at on the spigot, the range the rifle grenade is going to go. Yep, and there's a little chart that comes with the grenade launcher sight that tells you for the M1 carbine, Garand, Springfield, and Enfield, what angle, what setting, what grenade, how far it's gonna go. It's really a pretty cool piece of little tabular data. super data. cool, actually. Yeah. Now, now, that being said, you can actually set it where you can right, you can shoulder fire this. You don't have to fire this from the ground. Right. If so the idea is the farther this is on the grenade launching spigot, the more time it has for acceleration and the farther it will go. And the more recoil. And thus the more recoil because it's gonna get going faster. So the farther up you have it, the less distance, which also means the less recoil. I believe we said if you set it to three, you're pretty safe off the shoulder. That's what the chart says. We haven't actually tried that. No. Uh, we tried one of the, the real, the, the, the goody ammo uh, off the ground, which is the other way to fire it like this. Mm -hmm. And now uh, that had some pretty substantial recoil. Yeah, I had it brace against my foot and it didn't hurt me, but I could feel that out on the shoulder would have been unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. That sounded a lot more impressive. Um, so both were done. There was a wide variety of grenades that were used. They had smoke grenades, they had white phosphorus grenades, both for smoke and anti-personnel use. They had fragmentation grenades. They had uh, holders like this that allow you to strap a generic handheld pineapple M2 grenade onto the rifle. And uh, probably the most important ones they actually had were anti-tank grenades, mm. which were, frankly, they were about as effective as a bazooka, which mm. I, was kind of surprising to me when I discovered that. Um, the first ones would perforate two inches of armor. They were a little shape charge of TNT, about a quarter pound of TNT. And uh, the later iterations, later in the war, they were able to get up to three to four inches of armor penetration with basically this. So apparently, a lot of GIs actually preferred that to toting around a bazooka because you got about the same performance as a, an early 2.36 inch bazooka without having to carry around this extra piece of junk all the time. Now we left out one of the obvious bits. So this is a standard, you know, anti-personnel hand grenade, right? Right. And there's a spoon on it and a pin. Yep. So what would happen is you would put this doodad on there and that spoon is actually not in this unit, but when the unit's intact. Right, this is kind of a broken one. The spoon is, is held in the launcher. Yep, there's and, a little tab right there that holds the spoon on. And you would pull the pin before you fire it. Right. Because what happens is when it flies off the gun, that eventually, that spoon will break off or fall off and now the, cart the grenade is live in flight. Right. Yeah. In fact, it's interesting in the range data, there are a couple of the extreme ranges, you know, the, all the way on at like 45 degrees. They say, don't fire it here because uh, the flight time is longer than the fuse time on the grenade. And so it'll detonate before it actually reaches the target. So you get an airburst. Right. And there were guys who actually, there were some guys in World War II who got, and Korea, uh, who got really good with these things and would actually deliberately use airbursts when they wanted that effect. Um, interestingly, there are also some pictures out there of guys who took 
this tail assembly and uh, kind of clutched it onto 60 millimeter mortar shells Wow! and fired those things. Uh, that probably has quite a lot of recoil, but that's a lot more effective when it hits the ground. Yep. So the idea here was to have an intermediary explosive weapon that was that would take up that little bit of that range between the you know the farthest you could throw and the shortest that you wanted to call in mortars or other small artillery. Um, apparently these are quite accurate. The guy, there are some memoir, memoirs from World War II or testimonials, I suppose, mm -hmm. of guys saying they were really good for shooting through pillbox windows or doors. Wow. Um, you know, with some practice, you can really put these wherever you want them. I think uh, it's just a matter of time in the field and getting used to how it works. Exactly. Yep. Now, I've got this slick sight on the rifle, which uh, is pretty cool. It lets you set your angle. It's actually elevation adjustable, so you can zero it. It's got a bubble level here, so you can uh, know that you're actually at the angle you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And then that allows you to very precisely target this thing. It's got a little aperture on the front blade. Um, these were actually developed right at the end of World War II. They were issued at the very end of the war and basically didn't see service. But this would have been what you used in Korea. Um, they had a couple different iterations of the actual launcher spigot. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the sight's kind of a Korean thing. The spigot, this is actually a World War II spigot. They made some changes because the one real downside of this is I mentioned that you've got a little plunger here that opens a valve in the gas plug. Well, that means that even if the grenade's not on there, your gas plug is venting, and so you have a single shot rifle. If you load a clip of regular ball ammo, you can, you can shoot it with the grenade off. It'll go through there just fine, but you're gonna have to rack the action every time to eject and load new cartridge because your gas system's not working. Right. In World War II, you'd have like one guy in a squad typically issued one of these things, and he would probably, well, I guess it depends on the action. He would probably leave it on there and be ready to fire grenades, but that also meant he was not gonna be in the front line because his rifle was effectively a single shot rifle. Or if need be, you could apply suppressing fire while he gets his rifle rigged up. Right. You could do that so, too. Still usable in an emergency, but straight So since these sights were not in play really in World War II, pretty much the guys got good at gee whiz. Yep, exactly. Like, this looks about right. And I yep. bet you with enough practice, just like anything else, you'd get good at it. I expect so. Yeah. Remember, you're only shooting out to a maximum of 200 yards. And you are shooting a grenade. Yep. <laughs> that explodes, it has a radius. I believe the saying is that close does count with hand grenades. Yeah, so what this boils down <laughs> to is like the George Carlin joke. It's like, you know, someday, one, one point, some guy was out in the field and he goes, you know, I'd like to set those guys on fire, but they're too far away. White phosphorus grenade. Well, flamethrower was the answer to that <laughs> at that time. But now what do we got? I'd like to make those guys explode, but they're too far away. I can't throw that well. I have this. Presto. Awesome. So this stuff is all available. You may not, if you have an M1, you may have taken it apart quite a lot and never noticed that you do in fact have a spring-loaded plunger in your gas plug. Unless you happen to have a very old World War II gas plug, which by the way, looked different. Right, so the ones that, came, that predated this a grenade launching system have two lobes. It's like a horizontal slot for a screwdriver to open. Uh, the ones that do have a spring plunger have a cross. The most easy way to describe it is it looks like the World War II one's a flathead. Yeah, and the post, exactly. uh, the ones that are meant for the grenade launchers look like a Phillips. Um, and there is one exception, which is there were some reproduction early gas plugs made um, which will fit this plunger. So the, actually I didn't even think to mention that. Mm. With the early ones that didn't have the plunger, uh, the hole in the center was actually too small for the grenade launcher to fit. So you physically cannot mount this thing on the gun if it doesn't have a plunger. The exception being a few of the reproduction early gas plugs where they made that hole bigger than it originally was so it could fit the M5 uh, bayonets. Are you saying stick with USGI parts? Stick with USGI parts. Mm. If in doubt, take a screwdriver, a bullet tip or something, and you can push on that thing and you can feel it move. Or just don't bother launching fun rifle grenades. Right, or, yeah, that's but, always an But option. that said, this stuff is available, and if you've got yeah. the right parts on there, you can obviously not buy an explosive grenade, but you can buy the launcher, you can yep. buy a dummy grenade, you can buy, and by God, even with a not a real grenade, do not shoot a live round at this. It is extremely oh, bad. Yeah. It's a barrel obstruction. Yeah, Make sure you have blow up your gun. Or rifle launching cartridges, and you can do what we were doing today, where you're launching these big old things 200 yards away. Now I would indicate you really want to find this thing in the field once you've shot it off, because leaving it out in the field somewhere might <laughs> scare somebody. Yeah, someone's gonna freak out if they run into that. So we're making sure we find this after we shoot them today. So keep that in mind. But that said, there's nothing wrong with this. You can shoot those out there, have a good yep. time. And it's just a pretty cool piece of history and kit. Um, you'll find these. You'll also find some of the World War II style uh, training grenades, which are a big single piece with a round tip. You'll also find some of the, uh, the much later ones, Korea almost into Vietnam era, which are typically bigger and they're usually painted bright blue. 
Mm. Um, those are probably the most common ones to actually find on the market here in the US. Mm. So all fun. Uh, those the fins sometimes fall off of. We've fired this like half a dozen times now and it Seems I think it's a little tiny bit bent, but it's been remarkably good shape for it, having gone through that. It's good enough for G Wiz. Thump. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Oh. Yeah. So we actually have a spare site assembly. We're going to go ahead and give that away as part of our next Patreon giveaway. So someone's going to get that. We'll give you a little head start to uh, getting your own grenade launching setup going if you're so inclined. And, uh, and, and frankly, hopefully you enjoyed watching this. I mean, we always trying within range to bring content that's not necessarily common. Right. And this is sort of off the radar a little bit. People have seen these, they just don't know about it. And here's an educational bit on how these things work. And hopefully that's something interesting to you. Um, if you enjoy this kind of content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Quite honestly, it's what allows us to buy doodads like this and be launching them in the desert with the hope that we'll find them again. <laughs> um, if you can't totally get it, please just support us or subscribe to us on YouTube and Full30 and Facebook and share with your friends. Ding. You ready? Whenever you're ready. Like 200 yards. That's like a class eight out there. A lot of them. I got this. No. Oh!